in our book, we describe the consequences of that. I won't get into it great detail here, uh, except just to point out a couple important features of this thing. Industrial growth occurs because of this positive feedback loop here. More capital gives you more output, more output permits more investment, and more investment lets you build up your capital stock. And as long as investment exceeds depreciation, you have growth, exponential growth, and rapid rates of increase, depending on how equitable your society is people, at least some people, get richer. However, as we start to draw down our resources and fill up our sinks, more and more of that capital has to be drawn off to provide for the other needs. And eventually, you get to the point where you can't sustain investment around the industrial capital loop sufficiently to sustain growth. And in our world model, it's that phenomenon which tips you over into de decline. We're moving now into that period. Some people looking at our curves would imagine that the periods of greatest stress would be after the peak, once the declines have set in. I don't think that's true. Right now, around the globe, we're working, we, I mean, corporate, political, religious, other leaders, as hard as we can to sustain growth. For growth to stop, negative pressures have to mount until they're strong enough to offset our positive pressures. That's the period which we're in now. So I anticipate that the big stresses are ones which we're going to experience over the next couple of decades. Let me give one very quick example of that in the two minutes that remain to me. Uh, take CO2 concentration, which is here a surrogate for greenhouse gas uh, concentrations. Here again, we published this in 72. You can see the red line. And notice how quickly things accelerated uh, after our book came out. No causal relationship there. But on the other hand, uh, it's pretty clear nobody paid attention either. Why is it doing this? Everyone in the world wants greenhouse gases to go down, by and large. They keep going up not only in the United States, which didn't sign the Kyoto Accord, but in all the countries that did sign the Kyoto Accord. Well, here we see the crucial role of population. This is CO2 emissions. It's a function of four factors. The number of people, the number of units of capital per person, which is a surrogate of living standards, the amount of energy required to build and operate that capital, and then the fraction of that energy that comes from non-fossil sources. So far, our concern about climate change has manifested through efforts to improve efficiency and to implement alternative energy sources, the so-called technology options. I'll just close by pointing out that as long as we ignore demographic and cultural issues, the growth in those two first factors will continue to offset all the improvements we make in factors number three and four. And so until we can understand how to begin reducing the growth in those first two factors, climate change is a foregone conclusion. Let me finish with what is perhaps the most important uh, message of my speech. If you don't remember anything else, I hope you remember this. It's another exercise. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you all to clap your hands at precisely the same moment. OK? I'm going to, it's simple. I'm going to count to three slowly, and then I'll say clap. And precisely at that moment, when I say clap, you all clap your hands. Here we go. You too. Okay. One, two, three, <laughs> clap. <laughs> This is the important point. <laughs> Actions are much more important than words. You understood what I said, and you even wanted to do it. But as soon as my actions were different than my words, you paid attention to my actions. And it's the same thing for us. We can sit around all day and talk about population. But if we don't go out and do something differently, nothing's going to happen. Thank you. <laughs>